Hi there. If you don't know, I'm Graham, and this is Jeff. Hello, Graham. Hello, all. Can you tell me, why are we here? Today, Jeff, we're about to retrace the path the first steam locomotive took to cross the Blue Mountains. Mm -hmm. No one believed it possible to cross these mountains until three stockholders, Blacksland, Lawson and Wentworth, saw the necessity to find new pastures for their cattle. So in May of 1813, with the encouragement of the governor, the three set off from South Creek with four attendants, pack horses and several dogs and successfully blazed a path through the mountains to the Western Plains. Mm -hmm. The following year, William Cox began the construction of the first road west of Penrith, the Great Western Road, and Lapston Hill was one of his most difficult tasks. The steepness of the grade up Lapston made it a day's work for a team of 16 bullocks drawing a heavy dray to negotiate the short two and a half kilometre climb. There were seven turns, or traverses, as they were called, on the steepest part of the hill. The first section of the Western Railway line to Parramatta was opened with much rejoicing on the 26th of September 1855. Then, towards the end of 1857, Governor Macquarie directed Mr Barton, the Clerk of Works for the Colonial Architects Office, to determine the best line for a railway to the west. A very elaborate and careful exploration of the country between the Nepean and Bathurst was made, extending over three to four years, in the course of which several lines were surveyed and levels taken, but were afterwards abandoned for various reasons, as the broken nature of the country and the suddenness and the length of the descents rendered the discovery of a practicable line a task of extreme difficulty. Now it's time for us to see some of those difficulties and you can come along with us. We start off by going back to where the original line came up from Emu Plains. The red arrow indicates where we started and we'll actually pick up the video where the old line is crossed by the new line. And as you can clearly see here the green line actually shows that the original line did not go anywhere near what we're seeing today and a lot of the properties are actually showing that by having their back fences at an acute angle which is of course where the line used to go. Here you see the gap between the houses where the line went through and it's still retained by state rail probably as access to the uh, to the railway line. On our walk we came past the gatekeeper's house which used to function as a toll booth when the roads came through here and I think it was known as the Western Road. That was after the zigzag closed and the deviation opened in 1891. Here we see the monument to John Whitten who was the engineer in charge of building the zigzag. What you're actually looking at here is the point where the original line coming up from Emu Plains actually crossed the new line and swung off to the right and Graham's about to actually do that walk off to the right and see how it actually went up at the slope. Of course this part of the old railway line has not been developed for a walking track so it's very rough but we'll get through there and we'll follow that through on the blue line on the map. Having witnessed what Graham had to go through first hand, I really hope that the 2.5 million does incorporate this because it would help to make part of the picture of how the zigzag evolved.
This part of the walk was totally grown over and because it's been left, subsidence and uh, running water has made it rather difficult to follow. But as we'll find out, that um, we've got absolute evidence that this is where it used to go. So bear with us and we'll reveal that soon. And here is the proof that the actual line went straight through here, through these modern fences and gates, actually lines up straight with the knapsack bridge, which we are now about to walk towards. This is the Great Western Highway that came through 34 years after the Zigzag was closed in 1892. Our map's showing where we are now with a red arrow and we'll proceed down the blue line to the knapsack viaduct. They've done quite a good job of um, keeping it um, looking very pristine through there. Red arrow on our map shows where we are now and we're approaching Jeffrey. The Knapsack Viaduct, Graham, which sits about 40 metres above the floor in the gully, and although it does look flat, trust me, it is actually four metres higher at the other end than at the, this end where I'm filming this. Again, we see credit given to John Whitten, the engineer in chief for his contribution to this railway line. He actually uh, built many more than this one, Graham, but we're, we're just talking about the, the zigzag on this particular video, aren't we? Here we have the little knapsack viaduct which was built in 1913 when the current railway line bypassed the zigzag. We leave the knapsack viaduct shown in the red arrow and we'll proceed down this next short section of the track to show you where it mysteriously disappears. At first glance, it appeared that the line went underneath the road. We found the rail line actually continued where the dotted lines are after we scrambled up the side of the hill. We had actually noticed this plateaued piece of land and after, as Graham said, climbing up, Uh. 
after the zigzag was bypassed and the Great Western Highway used this portion of land, there are still remnants of the bitumen and double yellow lines used during that time. It goes to show, Graham, that we were able to do marvellous things in the early 19th century. But there's uh, fencing here. We've traversed the blue line. We're now at the red arrow. And unfortunately, this is where, as you can see, the railway and the subsequent road is obliterated by the new Great Western Highway section. And now our only way is to walk along this pedestrian footpath to the cutting and beyond to bottom points. On the map, we are currently at the end of the arrow. We believe this is the original cutting for the zigzag railway, so that it can go up to the bottom points. It has since been altered so that the Great Western Highway can now go above it, so it's become a tunnel, and also to allow traffic coming from Lapston to join the Great Western Highway heading towards Penrith. Now this is all new stonework, done for the alteration of the cutting for the Lapston Road. The stonework here has been placed to fill in the first part of the upward line to top points. We've reached bottom points where in 1867 the trains came up from the northwest. They came through here, past the pointsman's hut, and travelled through to the southeast where they went down and stopped and waited for the points to be changed so that they could traverse the second part of the Lapston zigzag. From the Red Arrow, we're proceeding down to the site of the lower dead end. What we discovered when we were here, that if the trains didn't stop at the lower dead end, there's a big gully they would have gone down. And as you can see, there's quite a gradient to come down to here. Before we finish part one, we'll show you how the trains bypass the zigzag after the Lapston Deviation Tunnel was opened in 1892. And by the way, we covered the Lapston Tunnel in a previous video. We walked back along the Armco on the highway exit to Lapston and discovered on the downside a flat section which we now know is a part of the deviation of the zigzag through to the Lapston Deviation Tunnel 
Unfortunately, Graham, there's not much of it left, but we can accurately tell by the few flat spots that you did with us there. Following the natural curves that Graham has found, the line goes across here to a cutting and then on to the lapsed deviation tunnel. That's it for part one. In part two, we'll show you the ascent to top points, Lucasville Station, or what's left of it, and then we'll do the rest of the climb at the, up to the top of Laston Hill. And as before, please subscribe and push the like button. See you then. See you then.